Welcome to Breadboarding. This is the second summary video for the Breadboard PC Intel 8088 project, and this is around 20 minutes summarizing videos 13 to 21 for the monochrome display adapter video controller. So why develop a monochrome display adapter compatible card? Why not CGA, EGA or VGA? Well, we need PC compatibility for standard PC DOS software to work. The original video controller developed as part of the 6809 project produced VGA output, but it wasn't PC register compatible. The monochrome display adapter is simpler to develop and certainly using dual port video RAM is even simpler. The EGA and VGA video standards use custom very large scale integration chips. These had sort of 144, 160 pins in high density packages, so not really suitable for breadboards. The MDA adapter can coexist with other video cards, so is useful for debugging. So this is a high-res picture of the original full-length monochrome display adapter. This included a parallel port as well as the video card. You can see here it used the Motorola 6845 video controller chip. There's also the character generator ROM here. There are about 66 chips in total. There are about eight RAM chips these other chips, plus 56 TTL logic chips in total. I think about eight or nine of the chips were used for the parallel port, but in total, we've been able to reduce this down to about 16 chips in our design. Let's take a quick look at the original IBM documentation. You can see the monochrome display adapter either as a standalone reference, which I'll include in the description below, or as part of the PCXT. And the key thing about this is it includes a lot of the high level information you need to know how to use the adapter. This diagram we'll look at in a second. So the programming information, the characters were on the even addresses and the attributes on odd addresses. And then there are a number of IO ports used by the card which we need to maintain compatibility and then there was a control port and the status port which again we'll also be implementing. And the key thing for the success of the IBM PC standard is they publish an awful lot of information so you can see here that they also publish the detailed logic diagrams on how the board was put together. So this is a summary diagram that I've included and we're simplifying things here a little in that the original design had a number of memory chips but we're just going to have one four kilobyte dual port video RAM and this means we can get rid of a lot of the gating and multiplexing and the video output stage down here is largely going to be handled by a VGA compatible digital analog converter which I used in the Nanocomp 6809 project and a lot of the video control logic for the video output is handled by three program or logic devices. We're also using a slightly upgraded video controller the Hitachi 68A45 S is capable of working at VGA frequencies and has a few extra features that simplifies the design. Now I've included a detailed review of the schematics in the full video so I'm not going to cover that now but just to give you an idea there are about eight out of the ten sheets are needed for the MDA and what I have done is gone through and identify the things in green we need to worry about the things in red can be excluded things in orange are just where I've made some notes or comments so you can see there's a lot of red on these which is means we're able to simplify them quite a bit. We've got the CRT status port here this is probably the most complex bit, which is the attribute output logic control, then one of the pages that we don't need to worry about. And then this is the output actually to the monitor itself. And there are quite a few red bits here, which we're able to simplify by only using eight bit wide characters rather than nine bit wide characters, as you can see here. So the VGA video standard was introduced in 1987 with the PS2 range. So at the time when the monochrome display adapter was produced and also the original IBM PC and PCXT, the only monitors that were available at that time had TTL digital levels, whereas VGA uses an analog level between 0 and 0.7 volts so this means it can provide continuously variable colors whereas the older standards for MDA, CGA and EGA only had digital levels and so that restricted the number of colors they're able to use. We're going to be using the 8 wide by 16 high characters which are closer to the VGA ones and the output will be the standard 15 pin sub-miniature D connector, commonly recognized for VGA. And as far as the timing, because we're going to do things with VGA, we're going to be using 640 pixels across by 400 lines at 70 hertz, and that will produce VGA compatible output using a 25 megahertz dot clock. So these are how the activities break down in the videos. We're primarily going to be covering the initial design information from videos 13 and 14, and then we'll be going through the build phases for 15 through to 21, and these will be speeded up. So in the first couple of videos, we're adding the IO port decoder, the 25 megahertz dot clock and the clock PLD that actually provides a number of the timing signals needed for the board. And then we added the cathode ratio controller chip, the MC6845 compatible Itachi device, and that produces the horizontal sync, vertical sync and display enable signals. The character clock is the dot clock divided by eight. That drives CRTC driving the video RAM and the outputs for horizontal sync and vertical sync. We then added the dual port video RAM just because that provides a lot of the signals we needed to wire up to the other chips here. And we also added the video digital analog converter and that would enable us to take these horizontal sync display enable signals out to the digital analog converter and we're just going to feed in some very simple test signals into the video DAC to do some basic testing of the video output. Just going to put in the power rails for each of the chips and for the oscillator and for the oscillator we're going to wire in the 25 megahertz output and just make sure it's in the right pin. Then we're also going to ground a lot of the leads around the oscillator to prevent any stray 25 megahertz signals getting onto any of the other tracks.
hook up the probe to the clock circuit and what we'll do is have a look at the oscilloscope output on the PC. So here's the output from the oscilloscope and we can see that at the moment this is on the oscillator output and if you look down the bottom right hand side here you can see this is 25.180 megahertz. There we have the dot clock divided by two. Okay so we now see the dot clock divided by four. What we can see here, this is our character clock. So this should be a 3.1 megahertz clock. So that is the character clock that the CRTC will be using. So the character latch, you can see here that this actually goes from low to high somewhere around just before the halfway mark. Now, if we look at the shift register latch, that should be a little bit later. Those signals look like they're pretty reasonable at the moment. They're just going to take some of the test connections out there. Now I'm going to put in the video RAM and get it to line up with the CRTC. Put the video back in there. Just going to wire up the video connector. Okay. okay, so I've just soldered in the pins to the VGA connector. Just to be careful, there's an extra pin at the top there, 16, which is ground. And we're just going to wire up these. So we've got the red, green, blue video signals. Then there's a lot of ground signals. And then there's a 5 volt with a resistor there to stop the monitor draining all the power from this board. Then the horizontal sync and vertical sync. Then we just need to wire in the ground rails there. Now we also now need to add the 75 ohm resistors to ground on the outputs there. And then we're now going to wire in the red, green, blue signals. Now we need to do the constant current source. And the constant current source discussed in the video in the Nanocomp series and the calculations for this, it needs a 15 ohm resistor to vary the current. And what I've done is put a small variable potentiometer in there, and this will be normally 15 ohms, but we can tweak it a little to increase the intensity. Wire in the dot clock. And now we need to just put the write enable and read enable signals and the A0 and A1 address lines, which we're going to wire up to the top there a little bit later. So now we're going to connect the CRTC memory address lines to the left-hand side of the video RAM. The video RAM is always going to be read and always enabled on this side. So now we're going to put in the chip enable, the address zero, the character clock, and the E signal and the read write signals. Just a little bit of confusion there which way around to do it. And there's a reset there as well. Okay, so just check those. So now we're going to wire up the uh, raster row address lines up to the PLD there. Just a temporary measure for the moment. Now we do need to temporarily put an inverter in for the display enable to go into the blank input to the video DAC. This will come from a PLD on the left hand side a bit later. Then we're wiring in vertical sync and horizontal sync. Horizontal sync also needs to be inverted as well. Put in a power distribution bar. Now we're going to wire in the data lines to the main processor board and the address lines. Then we're going to take the address lines up to the IO decoder. That's the A0 to A7 and then the top address lines as well. And now we're going to need to wire in the data lines to the CRTC and also to the video DAC. Now put it alongside the rest of the Nanocomp 8088. OK, so we're just going to plug in the data lines. The cables could be a bit shorter. Just need to tie the two boards together physically. And then putting in the reset and the E signals. I didn't quite put it in the right place, so just shuffle it down a bit. So that's the reset signal and then the E signal. Now I need to tie the read write on the CRTC to the IO write line, which is also coming in on the IO decoder up there. Now this is plugging the IO read and IO write going into the decoder. We'll tidy up those leads a bit later on. I need to do some tidying up in a couple of videos time. And this is the memory write signal going from the video RAM up to the top there. I also need to do the memory read as well. I think I might have forgotten that one. And then this is putting in the address line. So we've got the A0 to A7 are in a block, first of all. And then we've got the 8 and 9, and then finally 10 and 11. OK, so you can see here that on the VGA capture card, we've got black. We've got the normal intensity foreground. We've got the high intensity background. And then we've got the high intensity foreground. So this is bright white, this is kind of dark grey, this is light grey. So this is NDA test 2 and this should come out in green. Yep, so it's showing us the different shades of green and this is probably the closest thing to the original NDA monochrome display. So what I'm just going to do is to hook up two extra address lines on to the memory addresses and then I'm going to run the NDA test 3 and we'll see whether or not we can get the colours coming out of this. We're just going to run that 
And this is now showing the 16 CGA compatible colors that we should be able to get. So we've produced some basic video output. So we showed we had the black, white, and gray, the monochrome green shades, and also the CGA light colors. And now what we're going to do is we're going to be adding some extra chips to the board. So we're going to be adding the character generator ROM. And this is driven by the cathode ray controller. So it determines which of the rows of the character has currently been shown. Then the character output from the dual port video RAM determines the top four to 11 address lines, which then determines which character we have. And then the output of each raster row for each character goes to the shift register. The shift register is then cycled by the dot clock. And then we also get a shift register latch clock signal, which actually loads the data from the character generator ROM into the shift register. And then the shift register produces the output foreground background pixels. So one for a foreground, zero for a background. And then that's used to drive the video digital analog converter. In order to output the raster images of the characters, we do need some VGA compatible fonts. So Fontraption is a font editor that I'm showing here and int10h.org provides a lot of this information and a downloadable fonts. This is the MDA nine pixel wide font. And then if we look at the VGA eight, then you can see that in fact, the descender here really needs to be on row E or row 14. We'll be using this font to burn into the EPROM. Just need to tidy up the board, take out those test lead, the inverter, display enable, and the horizontal sync, fit the new chips. And we just need to move the character latch down a bit to give space. So just gonna program the EPROM with the font. So choose the font and burn that in. Okay, so just going to wire in the power connectors to make a better physical connection between the new board and the existing computer. Then we're going to add the memory read to the top of the board up there because we missed that out. Now we need to put in the address zero for the video RAM to QB, the display enable up to blank into the video DAC. Now we're going to wire up the various connections to the shift register. So the dot clock goes in first. Then we're going to tie the ground and various other pins to ground and to five volts. Reset. Now we need the shift latch lock and then the output of the shift register goes to p0 on the DAC. now these are the data outputs from the eprom we just need to label these so you can track them now when i wired these up unfortunately i paused the video after i'd done the first of the red lines so they just appear magically and i also then wired in the outputs from the crtc to the address lines as well but the video is paused so just put in the tight ground for the output enable chip enable so we just need to now download a test program so to start with i'm just going to download the black and white test one so mda test one so don't have any output at the moment and then when i run the program it should initialize the crtc and should then give us a nice repeating pattern of the vj character set so you can see here that the first character is actually a, a blank then we've got a smiley face so this is a good start so that's indicating that things seem to be working okay Okay, just going to wire in the power for the character latch then we're going to need to take the character latch signal from the clock on the left hand side over to the clock signal then we're going to wire in the output of the character latch to the address pins of the EPROM and then the data then finally we need to wire the output enable to ground okay so we're ready to try it now with the video ram hooked up to the character latch and the output there now to start with when we do this we're just going to get random characters on the screen because we're not setting anything in the test program in the video ram what i'm going to do now is to turn it on so let's just see if it comes up 4.84 volts that's okay there now when we run this we should have the test pattern up here and great so we've got a pretty reasonable test pattern you can see that starts at one the zero at the end which will be 80 is just missing a little bit so now we've been able to show the black and white character output from the character generator rom and the shift register using the video deck and what we're going to do now is to add the blink pld so this provides the clock signals necessary for the cursor and the character blinking and also the crt control and status ports which are needed to provide the signals needed to control the video output I'm just going to put in the buffer for the CRT status, put in the power lines, then we need to put the data feed from down the bottom of the board there. Now we're putting in the link for the port select. That needs to be tied to ground for the other chip enable. Now we're just putting in the output for the video for one of the inputs there. We'll leave the wire there for hooking up to horizontal sync at some later point. Just putting the pull-up resistors in there so now we're putting in the crt control port so there's various data lines the reset and the chip enable so these are the d2 d3 and d5 coming in from the there we're just putting in the chip select there we need to put in the reset now we're putting in the blink pld so just wire up the power lines there 
Now we need to wire in the pull-up for the inverse or not. So vertical sync is normal and horizontal sync is inverted. Now we need to wire in the horizontal sync and vertical sync. That's the vertical sync, including going to the clock. Then wire in the horizontal sync, vertical sync there. Now I've added the Blink PLD CRT control and status ports. What we can now do is finish off the last remaining chips we need for the MDA video controller. That includes adding an attribute latch to latch the data on the second part of the clock cycle, and the video output PLD and a attribute multiplexer PLD as well. And all these are driven by the foreground and background output from the shift register, the various signals such as video enable, blink enable, and the black and white color control from the CRT control port. And then the cursor and the blink clocks also then feed into this to produce the output needed to drive the digital analog converter. So just remove the horizontal sync and vertical sync, plug in the chips. Now we're gonna wire up the power and put decoupling capacitors in. Check the schematic. So we need to wire in output enable and the attribute latch. So output enable, just need to remove some of the wires to put the output enable in, put those back. And we're going to wire in the data bus going into the right hand side there. Then we just need to put the attribute latch clock in there as well. Then wire up the output to the input to the attribute multiplexer. So now we wire up the horizontal sync and the blink clock outputs. So blink for cursor and for the character. So now we're going to wire in the horizontal sync and vertical sync delayed outputs up to the connector there. Then we need to wire the video output and the alpha dot output between the two and also attribute 7. Then some of the other reverse video underline and no display coming out of the multiplexer down to the video output PLD there. We're just going to put the video enable and the link enable up there black and white, and then we need to wire the video enable and the blink enable together. Then the underline, and then the output from the shift register. So take out the digital analog converter tying to ground. So just gonna leave the top P7, P6, P5 wired into ground there, and then P0 to P4 will be wired in from the multiplexer. So completed wiring up the board. Now what I'm going to do first of all is to try the original test program. When I run it, we don't see anything. Now if I now switch the video enable from the positive output to the inverted output, what we now see is the pattern. So now let's try using one of the monochrome test patterns that I've got. So now I'm going to run MDA test 5, which should enable the necessary control port signals. Go. So you can see there, we've got pretty much the attributes coming out. You can see we've got a mixture of some blinking, some reverse video, there's certainly some underlines and things there. So we just load test six, which just disables the blinking. And we can see here, because the blinking has been disabled, then when the A attribute seven bit is set, then it actually gives us the higher intensity background that gives us a dark green. So in testing this, we've just updated the first character to be X. Now I'm going to update the next attribute to be reverse video, but what we'll see is it actually ends up being on the first character, not the second. So there's a timing issue here that we need to look into. And I've got some logic analyzer signals here where we can see that we just need to change some of the phasing of the particular signal here. So we're going to update the PLD to give the right clock signal, and then we're going to test it. I'm just going to download the program that does the attributes and run that. So you can see now that all the attribute data seems to be coming out properly and we've got our blinking coming out as well. Now, without the blinking, if that's the one with the blinking disabled, and you can see now that the high intensity background now has this dark green. So now we're just gonna have a look at the colors. So this is the VGA colors, CGA colors. So these are the colors as defined in VGA, EGA. Now, in fact, there is a good article here on int10.org where somebody's actually gone off and had a look at the voltages on a true CGA monitor to see whether or not any of these values should be adjusted these are in fact the values which are supposed to be much closer to the original CGA monitor colors. I'm just going to run the color test program and so what this is doing is showing us all the various combinations of foreground and background colors here and then down the bottom there is a block that just shows us the different colors so we've got black, dark blue, green and all the various colors coming along here and actually 
copied these colors in and you can see that the colors are pretty close to the original but this just shows that we're actually able to with the appropriate configuration we're actually able to show color on a monochrome mda adapter so that concludes a summary of building out the monochrome display adapter video controller if you want to see more detail then please have a look at the playlist at the end of this video to be able to see the whole of the mda series and in the following videos we're going to be building out the remaining steps needed to produce a basic floppy disk PC which is able to boot MS-DOS. Following on from that we'll be adding things like an IDE disk controller, developing a CGA video controller and then hopefully eventually be able to run an early version of Windows. So if you don't want to miss out on future videos please hit subscribe and if you can hit like as well it just helps to make the videos accessible to a wider number of people. Check out the links in the description below if you want to see any of the other projects that I've mentioned during this video. Thanks for watching.